Hey guys, thanks for joining me again and welcome back to the channel. This week we're going to tackle a lead study over the changes for Beautiful Love, one of the great jazz standards from the 1930s. We're going to construct the entire thing out of nothing but arpeggios. Of course we'll be following the changes very closely and we'll throw in a few little tricks along the way, a good helping of chromaticism as well as some solid bebop vocabulary. So it's worth mentioning that a couple of months ago I did a chord melody video lesson on this piece, so do check that out. We went into some thorough detail about the basic changes, which of course are going to form a big part of your roadmap for playing lead over this. So go get yourself a cup of coffee, grab your favourite guitar, make yourself comfortable, and join me for the next 20 minutes or so while we learn to solo over some beautiful changes. So to start off we're playing over a 2-5-1 in D minor, and we're going to just simplify the changes and take away any of the fancy extra extensions. So we have E minor 7 flat 5 to A7 to D minor. 2-5-1 in D minor. And we're going to play this phrase. 3-4-1. So we climb an E minor 7 flat 5 arpeggio from the minor 3rd onwards. Come back down a little way. And then we grab the major 3rd of the A7 that has now appeared. Thinking A7 arpeggio. And then D minor, sliding into the minor third from a semitone below. Come down a D minor triad, and then make a B line for a spicy note, the sixth. So the implication there is D minor six. So you get two, five, one. Then we move on to another 2-5-1, this time in our relative major key of F. So G minor 7 to C7 to F. Now when ascending this G minor portion of the lick, we're going to use the same kind of timing as we did in the first phrase. It's a very common part of the bebop sound. So we're coming in on the offbeat, in this case the and of 1, and then we go straight into a triplet run. So 1 and 2 and a 3, and then we're back into 8th notes. 1 and 2 and a 3 and 4 and. Compare that to the first phrase. 1 and 2 and a 3 and 4 and. I used to think of it as the Woody Woodpecker sound. Now in terms of the group of notes we're playing over the G minor 7, we're spelling out a G minor 9 kind of a sound. The 9 to the flat 3, 5 flat 7, 9 root. Now you can also see this as being a B flat major 7th arpeggio where you've very clearly got the root, the 3, the 5 and the 7. That's a good little trick to remember on a minor chord. Play the major 7th arpeggio for the relative major. So G minor, relative major is B flat. Think B flat major 7. Sounds great, right? Over that G minor. Very common trick in jazz. Wes Montgomery used to use that a lot. Now we're thinking of the 5 chord, the C7. We're going to play. So visualize a C7 arpeggio. Flat 7, 5, 3, 1. We go flat 7, 5, but then we're going to use this chromatic run to tie in from the 5 to the 3. Very easy way to apply chromaticism, and it will immediately lend your phrases a bit more of a jazzy feel. Just look for two points in your arpeggio and tie them together. 
back to the root and the flat seven. Then we're resolving onto the major third of our F chord. So that's our one. And we're just playing around with the F major scale there. Major seven, major sixth. Now we're thinking of another little quick two five, E minor seven flat five, A seven, back to the D minor. On the E minor seven flat five, we're simply gonna be thinking about the root. And then on the A7, A7 arpeggio material. You can see this A major triad here. We're going in from the minor to the major third, and then coming back to pick up the flat seven before resolving to the major three of your D minor, then the root, flat seven, five. We're thinking D minor seven now. Then we're on to another G minor seven. So we're going to play this honeysuckle rose kind of quote. Which again is made up of the same kinds of things we spoke about earlier. This G minor 9 tonality by accessing notes from the B flat major 7th arpeggio. As well as a G minor 7 arpeggio. Kind of combining the two things into a nice little palette of G minor goodness. Now this note here is landing right on top of our B flat 7 chord. The chord in itself is a B flat 7 with a flat 5 or a sharp 11. There is the flat 5, we're targeting it straight away. So we're thinking of this kind of chord sound really, G minor 7 to the B flat 7 with a flat 5. Now we're going to play around with the 3rd and the flat 5 a little more before resolving to the third of the A7. Don't forget to head on over to the links in the description if you want to get hold of my thorough lesson materials for this. That will include tab and notation in both PDF and Guitar Pro formats, as well as my backing track for this and my reference recording too. I'll also include a basic chord chart for this so you can track the changes along with the lines and see how the two things relate. I have a Patreon where for just £10 a month you can access all of my lesson materials, past, present and future, or you can just download this one in particular at the Gumroad link. Either way, your support is massively appreciated, so thank you very much. Now we're still on the A7, we're going to play this little group of notes, implying A7 with a sharpened fifth. This is just an A augmented triad. Then on to D minor again, we're going to play the root. So that's, which in itself is a 5-1. And then we're coming down a D minor 7 arpeggio down here within kind of the C shape. But we don't bother with the root on the end, we play this. So you'll have this. And then again we're grabbing the flat 5 of this G7 flat 5 chord that's now appeared in the changes. And then again, we just play around with the third and the flat five, just bringing out the two notes that really contrast and define the chord. And then we're thinking E minor seven flat five, we grab the root, slide to the minor third, because again, we're about to embark on this two, five, one, back to the D minor. And then here's your A7, walking down chromatically from the fifth to the third, very much like what we did there on the C7 earlier. So you get this 2-5. Then we're going to do a very common diminished chord trick. On the A7, take this portion of your A7 chord, add the flat 9 on top and look what you get. You get a diminished chord. Now if you haven't seen my video on diminished and how it works, do watch that. I'm pretty proud of that one and I think it will really help to clear up your view of the diminished and make sure you've got a tidy way of thinking about it. We're then just going to invert that chord by moving it up a minor third. So A7 flat 9. Now we're heading back to another A section where yet again it starts off with a 2 5 1 in the key of D minor. So on this E minor 7 flat 5, we're just going to visualize the arpeggio. And we're going to play this portion of it before moving on to A7 where we're going to play this kind of Grant Green style lick. Take the root and just chromatically walk up to your sharp 9 
and then back to the root, then down that augmented shape again. So we're getting all sorts of cool stuff involved there. A7, sharp 9, flat 9, with a sharpened 5th in the middle. All the good stuff. Now on the D minor, to resolve the phrase, we play... Again, getting all the good stuff involved. A lot of this comes from the D melodic minor scale. The 9th, the major 7th, the flat 7, not from the melodic minor, but it still sounds great. The 6th, very much from the melodic minor. So we're kind of implying all of these little decorative D minor sounds. Minor 9, minor 9 with a major 7, minor 6, all the spicy stuff. Now again, we're faced with a 2 5 1 in the relative major. G minor 7, C7, F major. And we're going to play this nice long eighth note phrase. Very clearly outlining the 2 5 1. Top three notes of that B flat major 7 arpeggio we keep mentioning. We're using that on the G minor, remember, to give us the sound of a G minor 9. And then we come down a G minor 7 arpeggio. But instead of playing this note here, we're going to enclose the major third of the chord that we're about to move on to, the C7. So there's your third. We're going to come in from a semitone below. Just kind of makes it sound that little bit smoother, a bit more purposeful. You know, less like we're just slamming shapes together and more like we're actually tying in, more like a singer would, you know, approaching a note in a more elegant way. Climb this C7 flat 9 arpeggio, which is the same thing as an E diminished, of course. Again, if you check out my video on the diminished, that will make total sense. Pulling off to the root, there's your flat 7. Again, we're going to walk up now to the major third of the F chord, spotting that chord on the horizon and trying to target the major third, and chromatically tying together the fifth of the C7 through to the major third of the F. So you end up with this long run. Two, five, one. You can really hear that. Now we're gonna add this, because we're still on the F chord, which really is just F major scale stuff, making good use of the major seventh. Now we're back on E minor seven flat five. There's your flat seven. Then we're heading to the A7, because again, two, five, one to the D minor that's coming up. On the A7 we play this. So this is the third, the flat nine again, the root, flat five and five. Really just visualizing an A major triad and just seeing what we can get either side of some of those notes. Sounds a lot like the melody for all of me. Same changes as well, of course, A7 to D minor. D minor comes up. We grab the minor third, root, flat seven, five. Next up, we're on the G minor seven again. As we have done every time so far, we're thinking B flat major seven arpeggio to give us access to those beautiful upper extensions on the G minor. Just climbing the arpeggio, again with that little um, pickup rhythm, with the offbeat into a triplet. And two and a three and four and. So B flat major seven, you got your seven, your root, your three, your five, seven, root, three, five. But over the G minor, we're getting that G minor nine sort of tonality. The next chord is that spicy one again. B flat seven with a flat five or a sharp 11. Just a quick side note, I think of it as a flat five because there's no five in the chord anywhere else. If I was somehow including the five here on the A string, then I'd be more inclined to call this the sharp 11. We're targeting that note again specifically, all the way up here, that E note at the 12th fret. Now the next little phrase requires just a little more explanation. In my head, this B flat seven flat five is kind of just subbing for the E minor seven flat five. So it's kind of like a two, five, one coming up again. That's your sub for the two. You can see how similar they are. Only one note different. 
is your E minor 7 flat 5, features this G note, whereas the B flat 7 flat 5 features this G sharp note. Point being, I'm thinking of them as interchangeable essentially. Um, so I'm going to play an E minor 7 flat 5 arpeggio and then grab the major third of the A7 that has now landed. Now we're back to the D minor, the 1, and we're about to do that final little turnaround. And basically we're just going to use the blues scale. So we're thinking D minor blues scale, we're grabbing the root and the flat 5 together. The flat 5 being the, the blues note of course, hammering onto the natural 5, and then using that flat 5 as a kind of pivot, that middle ground, pull off then to what would be the 4th, and then do a little trilly thing, before coming down to the flat 3, then the root, the flat 7. All of that being within the shape 5 of your D minor pentatonic scale. We're then going to move down to what we can think of as shape 4. And play this. Now to close things out, I couldn't resist but add this spicy little chord run over the D minor. So we're thinking D minor 6 9, which is a great chord in its own right. Root, flat 3, 6, 9. We're getting rid of the root and just doing a little bit of backsliding. And then we grab a D minor 6 on the top four strings. We grab this diminished chord. I guess this would be A sharp diminished, but really I'm thinking A7 flat 9. And then a D minor 6 with the 9 on top walk it down back to the root. If you dig the sound of that, do check out my video entitled Beautiful Jazz Chords. I'll link that in the description too. Uh, it covers a lot of this stuff, which really comes from the Barry Harris scale. It's a very useful little tool to have, especially for chord melody playing. Okay guys, so tonally this one's a little bit all over the place. Uh, as you could see at the beginning of the video, I was playing my 335 for the performance and I was using my Lazy J 20 amp and a Brown Amps Atom pedal set with the gain almost all the way off just to give it a little bit of bloom and compression. But for the lesson, I've been using my fairly recently acquired 1958 ES175 on the neck pickup and I'm running this through my original 1969 Deluxe Reverb amp. I guess the two tones are quite different, but to me it sounds good either way. And you could play this stuff on a flipping broomstick and it would still sound cool. Plectrum wise, today I'm just grabbing whatever was handy. This is a Dunlop Flow, I think it's a 1.14mm. I think that's the thickness of these purple ones. Uh, the strings on here are 12 gauge Deodario Pure Nickel. I think they're called EPN 21s, something like that. As always, I'm recording the amp through the Universal Audio Oxbox, which just makes life so much easier than setting up mics and all of that stuff. And I'm using no pedals at all today. The reverb you're hearing is just straight through from the amp. Okay guys, well thanks so much for joining me again, and I hope you got something out of this one. I think playing over these kinds of changes, using arpeggios, is a great thing to work on. You know, mapping out the changes in your head, being able to land your arpeggios anywhere on the fretboard and then craft them into nice little phrases. That's a real art form and it's a lifetime's work. It's something you can keep refining and you can keep sweetening your ability to do it. Obviously it requires that you learn your arpeggios all over the fingerboard for all of your common chord types. Those are things that can take a while to settle in and do require some good studying and a good practice routine. Speaking of which, I do now offer the ability to book private lessons over Zoom with me. If you go to the link in the description, you'll see a calendar where you can select a time slot that works for you, prepay in advance, and then it will automatically schedule a Zoom call. And um, we can chat about anything you want to chat about, work on anything you want to work on. I teach around 40 people privately, one-to-one, -one, every week, and have done since about 2007. So you're in good hands. But make sure you move fast, because those slots are disappearing pretty fast. 
As always, if you enjoyed this, please do like, make sure you're subscribed and hit the notification bell. All of those things make this channel way more visible to the YouTube algorithm. And that helps me out tremendously. As I'm sure you can imagine, these lessons do take a fair amount of work to put together. So if you can show me your support with the simple pressing of a like button or a subscribe button or leaving a comment down below or sharing this video with a like-minded guitar player, you know, that really does help me out and it means a lot. Okay guys, so again, thanks for joining me and I'll see you next week for another lesson. All right, take care.